Thank you. So before we start, Paula, can you pray for us? Sure. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing those of us who are here safely, and we um, ask you to continue to bring those who are on their way. Please give them safe travels, Lord. We ask you for your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to receive the message that you have for us, and uh, be with Kofi as he conducts the lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Paula. So, we are starting a new lesson. And the title of the lesson is Ephesians, from the book of Ephesians. It's my favorite book, actually. And I'm very excited about the lessons. And this week, our lesson is titled Paul and the Ephesians. So before we start, we have our memory test in Ephesians 1, verse 9 to and 10. So let's read that, Ephesians 1, 9 to 10. All right, it says... He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put in effect when the time reached the fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, so the introduction. So basically, the lesson... The focus of the book of Ephesians is, uh, is just, we can just summarize this as this. It is how to follow Jesus Christ in trying times and making Christ the focus of the church. So talking about trying times, just as a comparison, the lesson talks about the famous Gettysburg Address. Do you guys know that? So it's the... Um, Letter written by Abraham Lincoln in 1863, when after the the Civil War, where about 7,000 soldiers died, so he wrote the this letter, you know, and his belief was that the war was a trial or a test for the nation. So it was a the nation was that was created in 1776. So. He believed that that war would be a test whether the country will sustain or not. So it's the same thing that happened to Paul when he was writing this, uh, uh, writing this letter to the Ephesians. So before we start, do you have any idea what condition the church was in? The church of Ephesus, the people of Ephesus. Do you know what condition the church was at that time? Do you have any idea? What made him write the letter to begin with? People online, you can participate as well. Yes, any idea of how the church was doing back then? No? Okay, no problem. All right, so I'll give you a. They were growing still, and that they were having problems because usually his letters have to do with us. Good try, but no. Actually, that's a nice try. Thank you, Paula. Heidi, Heidi, any idea? Okay, so basically, the Church of Ephesus had a decline in the fervent love and devotion to Christ. Yeah, resulting to a lack of passion, zeal, and intimacy in their relationship with him. They had endured in the faith and suffered for Christ's name, but had also suffered the assault of false prophets trying to force the heretical teaching. They had issue with false apostles, and at some point began to lose their first love for Christ. So they had regular struggle against false doctrines. So that was the things that was happening at that time when 
Paul wrote the letter. So the letter was basically just if I want to summarize the lesson before we go, you know, in details, the letter was to encourage him to not lose heart. So he gave them a full description of the church, the church being the body of Christ, the church being the bride of Christ, the living temple, and the army of Christ. So he encouraged them to remain focused on Christ, to remain active members, and keep their hope. So just to give you a general uh, view of what was going on in the church and the, the goal or the, the purpose of that letter. All right, so if you move on to the lesson of Sunday, it says, Paul, evangelist to Ephesus. So the lesson kind of gives us a brief description of what the city was. So do you guys have any idea of what the city like of Ephesus was? What kind of city was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say it was a port city, yeah, correct. Uh -huh. it, it was a prosperous city, yeah. They were very prosperous, you know, a port city, so we have a lot of goods coming in and out, you know. They have a lot of uh, merchant uh, routes, so money was flowing through the city. The, everything was... On a, stand, a material standpoint, they were doing really great, great in that city. Now, I just say that because of that, they also, uh, if I read the, uh, what the, how the lesson describes it, the lesson say Ephesus was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire with a population about 250,000. And back then, that's very important. And also, Today, I think Ephesus is situated in Asian Minor, which will be in Turkey, somewhere in the region of Turkey. So it was the capital of one of the empire's richest provinces, the province of Asia, which covered much of what we know as Asia Minor. That's what I just said. And in Paul's day, the province was enjoying a time of growth and prosperity, like Heidi said, a port city, like you said. And then Ephesus was also at the crossroad of important land routes. While the people worshipped many deities in the city, Artemis, regarded as the protector goddess of the city, was supreme. Her worship was her worship was the focus of civic ceremonies, athletic games, and annual celebrations. So the problem with most of these <laughs> cities back then is when things are going great, the people tend to have many gods. And one of the most important one was Artemis, or another name for her was Diana. And she was the goddess of protection for them. So everything back then was related to Diana. So when they have uh, ceremonies or things are happening, like civic ceremonies, like, I don't know, they'll display Diana. When they have athletics games, you know, back then it was, you know, they'll display Diana. Annual celebrations, they'll display Diana. Exactly. She was viewed as a protector, but she was above all the other gods, you know, for them. And just imagine what the, the Christians in that city were facing. Imagine trying to stay faithful to Christ while everything around you just prays or, you know, or just puts those gods around, especially the Diana God. It was like all about entertainment. That's what it sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. So they held Diana to a very, very high regard, the people from that city. So that's so now 
there is a story that the lesson of Sunday gives. So now we know what the city of Ephesus was. We know what kind of gods the people kind of favored in that city. Now we have a story that I would like to read. Can somebody read Acts 19? It's a bit long, but it's very important. Acts 19, verse 13 to 20. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 to 20. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom, whom Paul pro preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time, when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear, <coughs> excuse me, a solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Thank you. So this is what I always love this story because we can learn a lot of things from it. So to begin with, let's just summarize. So there are a group of Jews, right? They decided to take a little, I call it a little bit of habit of casting dem demons using God's name and the name of Paul to cast demons. And they encountered one situation where they were overpowered by the demon because the demon answered them back and said, well, I know Christ, the one that you're talking about. I know Paul, but who are you? And he overpowered them. So what can we learn from this lesson? What can we learn from demons? <laughs> To begin with, yeah, yeah. It's a strange thing to say, but yeah. They also know, the demons also know who actually have true relationships with Christ. Amen. That's very important, huh? Yes. What else can you learn from this? Like, okay, yes. Good. So, I love all your answers. First, do not fool around with demons, especially if you're not spiritually equipped. Do not go into a battle without, you know, knowing the true Christ. Because guess what? The demons and the enemy, they don't know Christ like you said. They don't they know his power. And if you go in with false, not not intentions, but if you go there when you're not spiritually equipped, you will be defeated. Another thing that happened is when they were overpowered, it brought a fear in the city of God. It, it's, it's, it's so weird because you would think people would be like, wow, the devil overpowered uh, people of God, therefore maybe we'll turn to that, but no, the opposite happened. What happened? A fear just grew in the city. They were like, oh, now we better, you know, turn our, our heads and our heart to Christ because he's the, and then what did the new Christians do? They burn all the books. All the books that did not pertain to Christ, they burn it and really turn their heart to Christ. Why did they burn it? What was that represent? The burning of the books. And that was more, the books back then were more personal because they were all handwritten. They weren't just typed up and mass printed. Yeah. So it took a lot of time to write. So not only they were, they were personal and they were very expensive. Mm -hmm. 
and very dear to them, but they burn those. Why? What did that represent? Well, if it was, mm -hmm. I think the books, what was in the books is important to remember too. Yeah. Because Christians aren't opposed to education, but they were burning the sorcery books. Yeah. Because your thought is, well, they just, you know, why not resell the books? But they don't want to even resell the books because they don't want somebody else to learn about right. the, the sorcery that's in the books. Mm -hmm. So they're burning them basically as a show of things, saying, we don't, this isn't true, and we don't want anyone else getting it mixed up in the sorcery either. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, you sell it, you get your money back. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, they have that, like you said, they have a conviction, you know, that God is God. Mm -hmm. And like Ken says, I mean, if there's no good for them, why they should sell it, it's no good for nobody. Yeah. The purifying fire. The Lord cleans all the wickedness with the fires. And then he burns the books out of the destroy them. I really like that. So basically the lesson tells us that with the wider resident of the city, believers learn that the worship of Jesus must not be diluted with the worship of anything or anyone else. So basically, this lesson just tells us that you cannot mix Christ and other things, other worship. Because this was a city that was vibrant, prosperous. And then people, are, they, they have a very a big idolatry thing going on. And then some, here some Christians try to keep the godly thing. Now we have some people where they, they were playing both. Maybe they will attend church, they will learn about Christ, and on the side they have the books with the sorcery and stuff like that. And then, imagine some of them try to use that to go cast demons. That does not work. And that's why you know, they were overcame by, by the demons. So, the lesson of Sunday tells us that you cannot mix the worship of Christ with other things. So, Let's move on to Monday, a riot in the amphitheater. So over there also there's another good story that I would like us to read in Acts 19, verse 23 to 28. It's a bit long. If you find it, can you read it for us? Acts 19, 23 to 28. Has anyone found it? 23 to 28. Can you please read it for us? And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small <clears throat> profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we are prosperous by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of, fail of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. All right. So another very important story. So there is a man called Demetrius, and what does Demetrius do? He, I think he was a sculpture of those idols. His business was to make the Diana and all the artifacts for the city. Now, he noticed that a lot of people were turning away from his business model, meaning he was making money by selling the little gods, the little, you know, idols, you know, to people. And he realized that you no know, more and more people were turning to maybe Christ and his business or his, you know, portfolio and the profit margin was going down so he's like huh i need to do something so he goes and tells all his friends 
in the business and say, hey, something is happening. Have you guys realized that our profit margin is going down? People are not doing this and that. And it's because of those people pointing out, you know, the Christians at the time, saying that they're turning away, they're turning people away from our great God. Does he really care about Diana that much? No, I think this was all about profit, to be honest. <laughs> about money. So he got them to be furious. So there are a lot of things that we can learn from that lesson. But right after Paul left the city and he met with the he met with the elders of the church and he had a lot of concerns for the church at that time. And it's okay. <laughs> and then some of the concern that he, he told them to be aware of false teaching and to be aware of people that will draw the flock away. Eh? And then the false teaching in the church. So my question for you today is, if Paul was here sitting with us, what kind of concern would he have about our church? Locally or globally? What kind of concerns would he have? Okay, the youth, the youth living in the church, okay, that's a consequence, but what's the symptom? Like, what, what caused that? Paul had as many, had, they had as many doctrinal disputes in Paul's time as they do nowadays. Okay. They're, they're always arguing against what they do, what some people call old doctrine. I like that. Uh huh. What else? So we had the youth. We have uh, the dispute over doctrines and stuff, which leads to division most of the time. What else? The very attractions that the world puts out there to draw us away from. Exactly. Exactly. That's actually, so that happened in Ephesus where they had a lot of distractions, a lot of things that were going on in that city. And the Christians over there, they were, you know, there was, they had a lot of things that were distracting. I think sometimes I'm glad that I live in Chochilla because you just have to worry about what? <laughs> gas station and Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine, <laughs> imagine being a, in a bigger city with just a lot of attractions. It can be really hard sometimes to, you know, to, to leave the Christian life. Yeah. What else? What else could be a concern of our church today? You know, I was expecting you to have more response because I do believe that we're not perfect and. There's no distinction hardly of, uh, our, members and the rest of the world. I mean, <clears throat> you can take it to extreme, but I observe my kids, for instance, and kids from other, you know, parents that, you know, claim to be a dentist, but there's very little difference, really. Um, I don't know if we are to conform to the world or what, but the internet and the TV and all that stuff, you know, he has really sucked us in. Right there where we are, you know, with the, you know, we're in the little garden there. And so there's a little bit of a, you know, we get not so distracted. But by and large, you know, everybody is, you know, in the new way of doing things, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's pretty sad. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, again, back then people had Diana. Today we have what smartphones. We have a lot of. We even have money that is now an idol. So going back to, I just don't want to talk about the concerns, but I want to also talk a little bit about solutions before we move on, right? Because what's the point of naming all the concerns if we don't know how we can fix some of these things, right? So right quick, I know the lesson provides some solution later on, but um, Paula mentioned something that is dear to me, the youth living in the church. 
it is sad and you think that's just a chochila, but it's everywhere. You know, I grew up in the church and most of the kids that I grew up with in the church, they're not in the church anymore. And when you talk to them, they have some compelling argument, you know. And sometimes I wonder, oh, how did I survive it? Because they do have things that they say, you're like, okay, thank you, God, for making me stay, you know. Because at this point, you are the one that is, you know, just fueling my my faith in you. So how can we solve that issue of our youth living? I know. <laughs> you have to direct them to God because, look, this is something I struggled my whole, you know, most of my life, I should say. And I'm not saying it as in, but God is largely unseen. He's mm-hmm. up there, and I know about him because of the Bible, but in my everyday life, it's hard to, for me anyway, you know, to, to see him because he's always there, and I'm a material person in the material world. And I have to get up in the morning thinking of what to eat for breakfast because the day is long and you don't eat in the morning. Halfway through the day, you're hungry and so you're thinking about food, you're thinking about your car, you're thinking about your clothes you wear. So the spiritual part, you know it's important, but it's largely invisible. So you have to really force yourself to think of it. I think that a lot of our kids and a lot of the people, you know, they have the tendency of, not disregard it, but you know, it gets lost somewhere in the shop where I don't know how to say it. It's just, you're not thinking about it, you're not seeing it. It's not an everyday thing, you know. You have to really come every Saturday and think about your creator so you don't forget. Okay. But it's easy to stop doing it, I guess. Okay. So, I feel like what we can only do for them is pray for them. And ask for the Holy Spirit to do the rest because trying to convince somebody to come back to church is really hard to do because it's a personal decision, a personal conviction. And what we can do is always hold the door open, right? And pray that the Holy Spirit bring them back because... Just the story that we, we, we read about the people that were overpowered by the, the, <clears throat> the demons. Basically, in that story, God took care of himself. There were a lot of idolatry going on. People were mixing it. And what did he do? He created a situation and showed his power and turned the heart of people that were indecisive and playing the middle to show that. How did he, he use his power, you say? Yeah, he used his power. It's simple. He used his power. What exactly did he do? First, by making it known to people that the devil knows him. And that's something important to know. The statement of saying, Christ I know, Paul I know, but who are you? It's a very, very important statement. A very powerful one. You know, because, and then that's already a testimony to know that, hey, even the enemy know the God that we serve. Second, by allowing the demon to overpower the people that were mixing those things, it was also a testimony to know that you cannot play both sides. Either you stand to Christ or you're on the other camp. And that was a, a way of, you know, God taking care of. But well, the thing about that, though, is that the devil doesn't trash on you immediately. He lets you enjoy whatever for a spell mm-hmm. for a long time. He's halfway through your life or advanced, you know, that he catches up with you and, oh, no, you screwed up. But it's too late by then, maybe. I don't know. I've seen a lot of people. As a nurse, I go around town, you know, and I do my thing. And I notice that a lot of the problems that people have is because neglect of many years is not, you know, recent. But yeah. it catches up with them, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I I agree. I agree. All right. So, any, yes. Oh, this time. Sorry. I just wanted to affirm what Kofi is saying. It's critical that we pray. And yeah. God, Amen. even though they're loving this stuff, God can intervene and show them 
earlier in life than maybe some of us had what the what the wages of what they're doing are going to be. He can shake them up, and we also need to pray that we'll have the right humble and loving spirit to have you know the right words to say when they do ask us or they do come back. But it's critical that we ask God to intervene because there's most of it's just out of our hands, other than asking God. Yes, <clears throat> and before I move on. I would like to share a bit of, a little bit of testimony to the parents that maybe have the youth maybe away, right? I was, I grew up in a church and then my parents were very, very strict, meaning my life was spent at church. Did I like it? No, because I was also in a mission field and I did not have access to Christian school all the time. So I had to go to that world where, you know, I see things. I'm like, oh, they seem happy. And I have to do this. You know, I have to do choir. I have to do pipe fender. I have to do, and it became tedious. And my parents did not play around with doing other things. It's the, the Christian way, the Christian way, and the Christian way. Now, guess what? I graduate high school and now I go to college, Christian University, and I had a lot of options. I took the furthest away from them because I was like, well, I needed the freedom. <laughs> then I get to the Philippines, a new whole continent, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to exercise my freedom. <laughs> my first, <laughs> my first, my first semester I was only taking English because, well, I needed to learn the language, and I'm like, I had plenty of time, and you know, having time is not good for any young person. So I decided, hey, I'm going to do anything that I never done when I was home. First semester was great. Second semester, I was like, nah, this is exhausting. It's like, I'm not having fun, because every time I do something, there is that voice in me that says, hey, you know better, you know better. Guess what? After a year, I was like, nah, I need to return to Christ because <laughs> this wasn't working. So, yeah, you you might not feel, as a parent, I know you feel, maybe you feel like a, a failure because, well, you envision your, your kids to stay in the path. But guess what? You planted the seed. And all you can do is keep praying. And I promise you, the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to convict them and bring them back. It's not as fun as they think. Maybe it's curiosity. They'll, you know, they'll live. They'll see what the fun out, out there is. But later on, they'll always I come back. I your story, and I see myself. I, you know, was very similar. But, you know, last night I'm reading, uh, I'm, I'm listening to something. I don't remember it. I stumbled on the verse that says that, the devil is really mad because he knows he's almost out of time. Mm -hmm. And this was said, you know, a few thousand years ago. I mean, we're almost really almost at the end of time. So he was mad before. He's probably yeah. just trying to crash on them. And I observed in the news and, you know, some of the other youth that are not even from our church. And the devil is just really tearing them apart. You know, I worry for my kids. I really do. But the whole church, you know, the, the church as a whole. I observe that is the spirituality, or maybe I'm not looking at the right places, but I mean, you know, it's only a few of us anymore. Well, that applies to the remnant that's going to be saved. It's not the whole church. Yeah, I just want to be part of the remnant. <laughs> <And> my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, keep praying for them. Yes. Keep praying for them. You might think you're running out of time, but the Holy Spirit is more powerful than you might you think. And again, you just have to go out there and speak to people that enjoy the world to realize that they're not happy. It's just a front. You know, it's not as glamorous as it looks. Do you think that the Diana worshippers back in uh, Jesus' time felt that way too? That they were not really happy? I mean, I know that Demetrius guy was just happy to sell them the little figurines. <laughs> but I wonder if he's the same back then. I do not know how they felt about worshiping Diana, but I know that's what was safe. That's what was, it was the, the trend. Yeah, the, the thing to do. Same as our youth today, you know? 
they come here, they see us, it's like, yeah, I don't relate. And, and then kids cannot even sit at the table in the morning to have a bowl of cereal without a little phone prop against the coffee or the or the honey jar so they can keep watching whatever they're watching. They're constantly on it, you know? Yeah. It's so. not only your kids, I believe. You know, I'm I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I can't I don't know how to, I can't use one of those. I have a grandma. See, it's like I I had to go through some, yeah. It's there are a lot of distractions there, and for us again, praying for them, and they might come back, they might not come back tomorrow. But guess what? When they hit their adult life and they see, oh, you know, because adult adult life has a way of opening your eyes and kind of like making you face reality. Just pray that they don't make a lot of decisions now that they might regret the consequences later. So, yeah. All right. So let's move on. So the lesson of Tuesday is about the letter itself. So the letter has six chapters, you know. I hope we had a lot of time to read the whole book of Ephesus, but I encourage you to do that at home. What I would do is just summarize what it is. So basically... The first three chapters talk about the theology, the theology of the um, of what the Christian life should be, and then the other three are the practical way of Christianity. So the first chapter, the first chapter talks about the riches and blessings of being a Christian, of being in Christ, the spiritual blessings that the Holy Spirit gives you. And those, some of the blessings are what? Redemption. That's a, that's a blessing given as a Christian. Forgiveness. The forgiveness of our sin. That's a blessing. Having the wisdom to, of discernment. That's another blessing that maybe, maybe ignore sometimes, but it's very good. Inheritance. Knowing that we are to inherit the kingdom of God. That's a blessing. And then, grace. And then knowing that we'll be citizens of... So if you read chapter 1, basically, Paul is just telling these people, the church of Ephesus, that, hey, know what you have. What you have is what Christ gives you, which are the blessings. All right? And also, in later on in that chapter, it tells also about he prays for them to receive Christ's focused wisdom, right? Now, chapter 2. Chapter 2 talks to them about unity in Christ. You know, we had the answer where they say one of the concerns of our church today is like we, we spend a lot of time arguing and stuff. So we have different theology just popping out of Thing, and that's a breeding ground for the devil, to be honest, because if we cannot be united in what we believe, then divided will be conquered, you know. And then it says, chapter 2 also say you were once, you know, spiritually dead, but now you are what? You are born again, and then you are exalted in, with Christ, yeah? You are Christ's worksmanship. So chapter 2 really gives these people like, hey, you are not just, you've been created, Christ created you, and he took time with you, and that's how much he loves you, right? And then chapter 3 talks about Christ's fulfillment to the church, praying for them to experience the love of Christ. That's something that is sad today because a lot of Christians really don't know how much God loves them. And how do I know that? Because... A lot of Christians are so hard on themselves, especially when they sin, thinking that they're not deserving of Christ because they made a mistake. But what the truth is what? When you know how much Christ has loved you, there is no remorse that you can have or no situation where you have to think to yourself that, oh, I cannot come back, that God will not forgive me. So we have that situation today. Chapter 5 moves to a practical Christianity. 
and now it highlights also it talks about unity as well but also gives a description of the church being the body and Christ being the head and it brings the this notion of unity where because we are all in the church and we have a role to play you know the role might not be what what Paula is capable of doing in church Maybe I may not be able to do it, but together we make the church function. Amen? And then chapter 5 also talks about the, the practicality, but also it goes, it talks about work, living in the light of God, work in wisdom filled with the Holy Spirit, and then the practice of Christ shaped in our in the household. That's very important. It's not only here that we need to live the Christ life, it's also our home. You know? Our family dynamic should be Christ centered. So all of those things are brought up in chapter five. And then chapter six is actually my favorite where God gives us all the provisions for winning spiritual battles. That's why he gave us the armor of God, you know, and that's where we can read, you know, everything that we need to have from having what the truth or the helmet of salvation and all of that. So I love all of these things. So if we read all the book of Ephesians, what does he really say to you personally as a Christian or which part do you love the most? Let's say... I did not know Christ, and then you come to me to tell me about the book of Ephesians. How would you sell me on it, or what would you, how would you convince me, or how, how much can you tell me about how the book means to you? Yes? Book of Ephesians in general. I just summarized the book, but I would like to hear more of how you guys feel about the book or what, which part do you really love, love the most? Because there are some very beautiful verses in that book. I like the, armor. the armor part, yeah, yeah. What else? Ken? <laughs> yeah, just in the book in general, what does it mean to you, this book? Because it's a very complete book. For a Christian, basically, it's like a manual from how Christ loves you all the way to how to be equipped to live the Christian life. Well, in college, mm-hmm. I was given Ephesians 5 to study. Okay. My professor wanted me to hammer down the, uh, the interaction between men and women as it relates to Ephesians 5 scripture. Okay. So. It's exciting. So I need to repeat it. Okay, so okay, so just give us a few summary so we can know what you learn or from it. What I learned from it? Mm-hmm. I might get out of church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell us something that can be uplifting for the rest of us. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. When you get to the five, he's talking about how we relate to each other. We should relate to each other as husbands and wives, as uh, fathers and mothers, children, as Jesus relates to us. Amen. I love that. Mm-hmm. And then I just kind of thought about, um, uh, so our struggle in verse 12 in chapter 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Maybe I'm going to ask another question. So, for our church today, which part of 
Ephesians that you think will apply more to us? Everything applies to us, but something that we need to pay attention to, maybe. Um, well, since I didn't read the lesson, okay. but the summary of chapter 11, mm-hmm. <laughs> Practice Christ Jesus Life in the Christian Household, I think our true characters really show in the household. Yeah. So, <laughs> if we can make our homes, you know, like Ellen White says, something like make your home a little piece of heaven, mm-hmm. it should be a pleasant place to be. Everybody should be able to be themselves with, you know, without judging each other, but also just uplifting each other. It, it should just be a piece of heaven, and your character should fit heaven. Okay. I love that. Yes? Anything else? Ephesians. The Ephesians 5 family that Paul is referencing, that one of the themes that comes across is the lack of selfishness that God is calling for. Mm-hmm. And I think some of that some of that. That is our major problem. That's what we pass on to our children and creates problems for them with the church and in some respects to you. That's what we were talking about earlier. My selfishness is what separates me from God because I want to do what I want to do. Okay. And we tend to pass that on to our children too and say we create a selfish environment. Yeah, but I want to do this. I want to play this. I want to do this. I want to do what I want to do. And that Ephesians 5 model is not about selfishness. Okay, so what is the, can you talk more about the perfect model to have in the family? Because today, I don't know, placing the the man, you know, on top, you know, that will bring a lot of discussion and, you know, <laughs> turmoil. <laughs> And then another thing is, you talk about selfishness, right? One of the main reasons the kids that have left the church, you know, uses, oh, I was, this was forced upon me. I did not have my say or, you know, I was forced into something, you know. So how do we now devise the perfect plan to live in harmony? where everybody gets to be themselves, but also living Christ's truth in the family. I just want to have the perfect... I thought that was the Holy Spirit's job. Yes. The Holy Spirit... Okay, yeah. The Holy Spirit, but also we are talking... Yes, the Holy Spirit will help a lot to bring the harmony. That's good. But also, I mean, let's be honest with the reality of things, you know. As a, okay, let me talk to the husbands now. As a husband, how would you lead your family then to have the perfect Christian life? And then as a wife, what is the role that you see yourself? And let's talk about our time right now, you know. What do you think you can do? And then, I mean, we don't have any kids here, but, you know, what role do you think you can have in the family, you know, just to have that perfect model of the Christian home? As long as my wife puts in 100% of what she's supposed to do, and I put in 100% of what I'm supposed to do, there's no problem. See, using the term suppose also already brings turmoil. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you know, (laughs) you know, every time you tell your partner you suppose or you must, you know, it's not really a decision of freedom anymore. It becomes, you know, so, yeah, I really want to have, like, this picture of the perfect, not the perfect family, because I don't know if we can achieve perfection in the family, but the the model of a Christian home. Like, what does the father or the, you know, or the man needs to do in the family? And then I want to hear from, I just want to hear your, you know, your opinions. Well, I mean, I'm still early on in the process, although they can see your kids' characters, well, shockingly early, but yeah. um, it's the, the thing for me is children are born selfish. 
Okay. We are born selfish. So then there is a process of showing them the Holy Spirit in Christ and also pushing them to be unselfish, to think of their sibling, to think of mom and dad. Um, and so sometimes there is a level of you're going to do this. Sometimes there's a level of you can pick between these two things. You can't pick whatever you want, but you can pick between these two things. I think the model of letting the child decide whatever they want to do and they'll pick what's best has been tried in our culture and we're seeing the results of it. And our youth are depressed, drug addicted, anxious, fearful, mm -hmm. addicted to other things other than drugs. I, I don't think that the model of the child picking for themselves is one age is working. And so I think parents have to guide the decision making process at the beginning. Now obviously you can get too aggressive and we all know very famous stories of parents or cults that have very restrictive things for their children. And that is a problem too, but that doesn't really seem to be a problem our culture is struggling with. We are wealthy enough to give our kids basically whatever their hearts desire. Yeah. But in the reality, our kids are no happier, maybe less happy than kids that have almost nothing. And that's only been the last probably 100 years of American society Everybody loved their kids, but the kids had to work to help out enough food for the family, to go clothe them and things back. And so the blessings that we receive have also turned into a negative. And that we as modern culture can afford to give our kids everything, but we have to be careful with that because giving them everything has not made them happy. I mean, the youth death rate is, is shockingly high. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, you got to remember that, yeah, we got kids, but they got free will just like us, and we don't like us, and precisely like us. We don't really own them. Right. And uh, the idea that, I, you know, God, I think Satan and Jesus were both children of God, and one turned out badly, and one turned out well. You know, blaming or praising parents for raising somebody in the kids bears the burden. We all have a choice in life. We all choose. I, if, I had, if I had been, I was raised by a, a pretty violent father. I mean, he was a 260 pound, six foot four, former heavyweight champion boxer. And he didn't mind punching me or hitting me when I grew up. And you know, one somewhere along the line, I didn't say I hate parents and I hate authority. I just said that they're wrong, I'm not bad. You know, somewhere along the line, I picked up that even though this guy was. Pretty brutal. He wasn't right. He was wrong, and, and I didn't, you know, and, and I learned to not respect authority, and I don't. Do, and uh, I always challenge authority, always, because of that. But it's our choice. We get to choose. Life is our choice, and uh, you can. Give kids everything, or you can give them nothing. What you do is give them love and consistency, and they'll probably turn out all right, regardless of what you give them. Give them love and consistent, consistent rules mm -hmm. that are fair, and you'll get good kids. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you very much. And I also wanted to talk a little bit of chapter four that talks about unity in the church you know i sometimes ask myself especially i see it here a lot where because of culture we have we have different groups like we have latino churches we have black churches and we have you know the standard church and then i ask myself because you don't see that where i come from 
you know you just see a lot of people all watching me together but here because of culture and maybe what you're comfortable with you you find yourself with you know and sometimes i wonder if that does not affect you know how united we should be in the church you know and also i think deeper i say well maybe what's the point of having everybody together if because of culture we maybe don't have the same experience of worship so i don't know does anyone want to touch on this you know before we move on i read verse two for you Mm -hmm. in chapter four be humble be gentle be patient with each other making allowances for each other's faults because of your love Mm -hmm. and that's a hard thing to do and you know my opinion this planet is a special case. I think that God's laws work perfectly in the rest of the universe. But because of sin, God's laws are still better. But because of sin and, you know, the other people who don't accept God, it's hard to keep. If you follow all the rules, if you do exactly as Jesus says that we should, you probably don't end up crucified here in this planet. And that's just a fact. I was reading yesterday, and I guess we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, if we submit to the rules and to the highest standard, high moral standard we're called out, we're going to end up like Jesus. We're going to end up, you know, mistreated and misunderstood and, and all the other stuff because we are in this world. That being said, striving for the what is correct, it should always be better. But here on this planet, I think that you have to, like, Sometimes, you know, kind of, I don't know how to say it. I really don't have words to, to you know, the, the right thing would be to be obedient to the T. But when you're training with other people, you have to give them a slack. For my kids especially, you know, because I, somebody mentioned it earlier, if I harp too much on them, they will try to wander off. Uh, the alternative is to try to help them in every which way, but you always end up picking up the slack and doing the extra work. And it's the same thing for everybody else. And in our church, in our group, somebody's got to be the, how does my mom call it? The, uh, the mature, the, the spiritually mature. You have to be the first one who takes the first step and, okay, brother, whatever, you know, help you out, regardless of your occasion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's hard. It's difficult because of what uh, Ken says, we are selfish. I don't want to be the one who will bow and, okay, brother, you go first. It's mm. like, no, 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 you know, it's first me, and then if there's room, then you guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, uh, the good thing is we'll have a lot of time this, you know, quarter just to to go through all of these chapters. So, let's continue. I would like to read First Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. It says... For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Amen. So I read that verse because the lesson on Wednesday says what was... um. Paul's deepest desire while writing these letters. Well, he wanted to convey peace, the law of God, and especially grace. And grace was something that was dear to Paul because he uh, sometimes did not even feel like an apostle, but because he thought that, well, I persecuted the church to begin with because that was his early days. And he did not feel worthy, but at the end he said, no, I do believe that I am worthy to be called an apostle because of God's grace, I am the same as the ones that we know as the 12, you know, because of God's grace. So when, while writing the letters, he was conveying those important things to the church, peace, love of God, and then grace. And then later on, uh, it said that Paul was in the prison, actually. He believed that he was in prison when he was writing the letter, and he wanted the church to realize that him being in prison should not affect them, but they should not lose heart, you know? And the same today in our church, 
when we see somebody going through a hard time, should not discourage our work with God, but strengthen our, you know, our faith to know that, you know, nothing is impossible to God, you know. So he wanted to show that, yes, I may not be in the perfect condition right now while I'm in prison trying to write to you and try to encourage you, but you should know one thing, that you should keep your faith, you know, alive and then just keep your work with God. And then... The last one, Ephesians, the, a Christ-saturated letter. I really love this, and I'm just going to quickly read some parts of the lessons that are really important. So, how can the message of the Ephesians be summarized? From prison, Paul set forth a vision of God's Christ-centered plan for the fullness of time and the church role in it. God has acted in Christ to initiate his plan to unite all things in him. Amen. Things in heaven and things on earth. And he did so by creating the church as an entity composed of new, of one new humanity of both Jews and Gentiles. So this also brought together Jews and Gentiles because back then there were very divided crowd, but Christ, when Christ was introduced, all of those people were brought in together. Believers are called to act in concert with the divine plan, signaling to the evil power that God's ultimate purpose is underway. As Ephesians 1 verse 9 10 proclaims, the unity of God has in mind. No, the, sorry. As Ephesians 9, as Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10 proclaims, the unity of God has in mind is centered in Christ. So it is no surprise to discover that Ephesians is a Christ center, a Christ drenched letter that everywhere praises the action of God in Christ and celebrate the access of believers to the spiritual resources offered in Christ. Paul employs the phrase, in Christ in similar phrases in more than 13 times and every year, everywhere lifts up Jesus. So basically, the whole letter has something to do with what? Christ. Christ the center of everything. Christ the center of the church. Christ the center of the family. Christ the center of our personal life. You know, when we're walking with him. Christ that brings people together and doesn't divide people. Christ that allows the church to actually reach out to people because that's also part of the gospel, you know, to show the love of Christ to people that even sometimes we don't think are deserving of the love of Christ. Amen. So when you go home and read again the book of Ephesians, just have in mind that everything in that book is Christ-centered. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful lesson that you've given us. Thank you for showing us that you are a loving God. A God that died on the cross for us. A God that gives us so many spiritual gifts. And we thank you. We ask you to be in the midst of our church, to send us your Holy Spirit, so we might be united more than ever, and also we might walk with you. We have things that we hold dear. We are really saddened to see a lot of our youth leave the church and we're asking you today to send your Holy Spirit in their hearts. You know, we know you love them. You know we love them. Help us to always open the door for them and please be with them in the world. Convict them to come back to you and show them your love and what it means to be loved by you. Thank you for everything you're doing. For us in your precious name we pray. Amen.